through submission to authority. When we submit, so I, say, I want power. I don't know about you, but I desire the power of God. I, I decide, desire the move of God's spirit to heal and to save and to deliver and to bring peace. Now, if I'm to have that, I have to submit to those that are over me in the Lord. Amen. And I gladly lay my ministry at your feet today because I want power in this house that God would move and bless. Uh, another thing for me to just share with you, I, I really am going to mess you up if you were here last week because I want to start where he finished last week and then I want to finish where he finished last week. Hallelujah. <laughs> Now, the, the only way I could really do that is re-preach your sermon. I'm not going to do that. Amen. But what he was talking about and what we're celebrating today is praise and worship and, and, and uh, exaltation of God. And Pastor did a phenomenal job last week talking about the, the majesty of God, the glory of God. The, oh, sometimes we forget that our God is an awesome God. He, oh, no, you didn't get it. He's bigger than that. I, no, no, he's, he's greater than that. Yeah. He's more powerful than that. Whatever that is, uh, he's that kind of awesome God, and he desires of us worship and praise. Uh, and you know what? We literally ought to be dancing in the streets today. Yeah. Now, I, that that happens, I'm not responsible. I, I have no rhythm. Hallelujah. In fact, I used to, back, you know, when I was real young evangelist, and I, I'd, I'd want to dance, and my kids would get so embarrassed. Uh, they'd say, Daddy, don't ever do that again. And I'd say, why? They'd say, because you look like a wounded ostrich. And I'd have to remind them, I'm not dancing for you. I'm dancing for him. And he likes my wounded ostrich moves. Amen. But, uh, but we ought to be dancing in the street. This is our week. I said, this is our week. Amen. This, this is not the American week, the Chinese week, the Korean week, the Hong Kong. This is the Christians' celebration week. This is what it's all about. This is the fulfillment of God's plan to restore man into right relationship with Him. And He said, I so loved you that I'm going to give my only begotten Son to, to die for your sins. Do you do understand? You do understand that's what we're celebrating this week. Amen. And, and, and it's not like other celebrations. It's not like we celebrate Christmas and that's good. We celebrate the coming of Christ. We don't know when Christ was born. We don't know if it was in, we think it was in the winter. We believe that, but we're not sure of that. But we can be sure of this, that this is the season that God chose uh, to send His Son to suffer and to die. And the reason we're here, amen. Oh, come on, folks. I, don't you like celebrations? I, I love coming here during Chinese New Year. Amen. Those red, little red envelopes, everybody ought to do that everywhere. Amen. <laughs> that ought, that's a good plan. Amen. But, but you've got to understand, the world can't celebrate with us today. For they don't know our Christ. They don't know the life of Jesus that's in us. But we have a privilege today to worship and to praise Him. Could you turn with me to that 20th chapter of the book of Matthew? I don't have a PowerPoint. There's a reason for that. I'm going to read a rather lengthy reading as a context, and then I'm going to take a passage for a text down in that 16th verse of that 21st chapter. And it simply reads like this in God's Word. And when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied with a coat uh, and with, her, uh, with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and immediately they will send them. And this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king comes on you lowly and sitting upon a donkey, a coat, the fold of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and they brought the donkey and the coat and then their clothes on them and set him on them. And, every, and a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others uh, cut down branches from the trees and spread them uh, on the road. And then the multitude who went before them, who followed and crying, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. And when he had come into Jerusalem and all the city was moved saying, who is this? So the multitude said, this is Jesus. 
Yoshua HaMashiach. This is Jesus' prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. But here's the verse I want to take as a text. It's in that 16th verse, the B part. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing children, you have perfected praise. Anoint me, Lord. Without your anointing, I'm a sounding brass and I'm a tinkling cymbal. With your anointing, God, with anointed hearts, lives can be changed and we'll be careful to praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I wish I had time to lay the foundation of this story. I wish we could just in capsule form realize that Jesus is now 33 years old. Twelve years in his childhood, we have some, some idea of what was going on. We know that he went to Egypt. We know that he came back. We know uh, some parts of that. We know at 12 years old, he was left by his mother and father and came back a day, a day later, two days later, and found him in the temple being amazed by, by the teachings of this young man. But then after that 12th birthday, we hear nothing. 18 years. 18 years of silence. 18 years of the mundane. 18 years of being hidden by God until the time was right to bring out his son and present him as Messiah. When he's 30 years old, he makes that grand appearance. Uh, he begins to call his disciples. He begins to preach and to share the word of God that he fits all of the prophetic utterances that he is Christ. Don't let anybody kid you to, to think that, that Christ was not aware of who he was. When he was 12 and they came back to get him, he said, I must be about my father's business. When he turned the water into wine, he said, woman, what do I have to do with you? My, my commitment is to my father. That's what I must be. And so for three years, he has been ministering, mostly ministering, healing. But healing wasn't his forte. Because he would heal the lame and say, don't tell anybody. He, he would heal the blind and said, please don't tell anybody. That, those things are wonderful addendums to who God is and who Christ is. He does meet our needs physically. But if that's all he is, is a physical Christ, we are sadly misled. He chose 12 disciples to be with him and he, he, he poured himself into them for if somebody does not understand that he is Christ, he is Yeshua HaMashiach, then this whole thing will fail. And even to the closing days of his 33rd year and him being crucified, he's still not sure his disciples understand. In fact, he has just taken them on a journey. You can read it for yourself. He took them on a journey to, uh, up into uh, Caesarea Philippi. I I'd like to come back and preach why he took them there. The most evil city that there was in that day and time. He took his disciples to the most evil city to ask them, who am I? Because you see, Caesarea Philippi was the birthplace of Baal. It was the birthplace of Moloch, gods that demand blood, God that demand everything. And some of the world today still serves that God. And then there was the, the God of Pan that uh, had his residence there in Caesarea Philippi. He was the God of wine and of lust. Uh, and there, there's a lot of people in our world today that have chosen a Messiah that satisfies them through lust and through addictions. And then there was a huge alabaster temple that sat in Caesarea Philippi made as an, as an offering to the God Caesar. God government would be their God. So Jesus walks them through there and he said, Who do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? Well, the others didn't do very good. They said, uh, You're one of the apostles, or you're one of the, the, the prophets, you're, you're, you're John the Baptist, you're, 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 you're Isaiah, you're one of those. Peter didn't get it right a lot. Oh, come on, I'll, don't you love Simon Peter? <laughs> Somebody, why do you like him? Because he's human. I don't know about you, I get nervous when people are too perfect. No, y'all don't have those here in China. We only have those in America. They, they float in on Sunday. <laughs> Do not touch me. I sort of like the guy, Simon. Simon messed it up a time or two. But he got it right this time. When he said, who did you say that I am? And he said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. But he didn't get it all right. I know he didn't get it all right because immediately Jesus is so relieved that somebody knows who he is. He said, I must tell you, now, now, now the cross and the crucifixion and dying follows. Peter didn't have it right because he got in the face of Jesus and said, there'll be no dying in this religion. We'll have no dying. No, 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 no dying here. I, I, if I had time to preach, I'd tell you that, that Peter wasn't upset with Jesus' cross. 
Peter was upset with his cross. You understand that Peter realized if Christ took a cross, that would mean to follow him, he would have to take a cross. I'm really preaching better than y'all shouting. I'm telling you, we have forgotten that when we take Christ, somebody said, Jesus died on the cross to keep me from dying. Oh, you have missed it a thousand miles. That is the greatest heresy that has ever been put on it. Jesus never died to keep you from dying. He died to say, follow me in death. And I will lead you to eternal life. I don't know if you felt that. I just felt that. And so, so Peter says, no, there'll be no dying. So now Jesus is starting back to, to face the Passion Week. That's what we're starting today, the first day of the week, the Passion Week. Not fully sure that anybody understood why he was here. One man, he picked up one man on the way back. He passed through uh, Jericho. We call him Blind Man Martabaeus. And Martabaeus got healed. Do you know why he got healed? Because he called him Jesus? No. He got healed because he knew who he was. While the disciples were confused and while the rest were confused, Bartimaeus cried out from the crowd, Thou son of David? I got you, man. I know. I, I've already got a revelation. And Jesus said, Bring that guy to me. I've been all over the world looking for him. Amen. And he follows him. And now they come to this first day of the week. And Jesus speaks to us. Is this hard to be this simple? That I don't have a text or outline. This is my little daily journal that I'm going. Do you understand that Jesus speaks to us through pictures, yes. not concepts? If I had time, I'd tell you the reason that the American education system is suffering because we moved to concept teaching years ago and we lost a generation. Uh, Jesus has always understood that we understand in pictures. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. Dog. I say dog. What do you see? Well, some of you see those little make-believe dogs, little short tails, and I got a dog at home. Cooper's his name. About 125 pounds of dog. Hallelujah. But when we think of dog, we think nose, ears, tail. Pictures is what we think in. And Jesus knew that. And so he's about to paint a picture that we need not forget. He enters into Jerusalem on the first day of the week at a very appropriate time. He tells his disciples, I've prepared already, go and, and find a fold. Find the fold, a, a coat of, of, of a donkey. Bring, bring that to me. I, I want that because I'm, I'm about to paint a picture. I'm, about, I'm, I'm going to show the people who I am. They, they don't really know yet. You were right when you said a while ago. They did not know. They, they, they had been exposed, but they, the, the reality, the revelation had not come to them who this man really was. So Jesus has to give them a picture. And they bring this coat and they set him on that coat and you were right again because you see, our king comes not on a steed, for you see kings that come on steeds, snorting, breathing, tense, horse flesh, ready to spring at a moment's notice. They always come in war. That's their sign that we have not come in peace. See, the reason they didn't recognize him, that's what they wanted. They wanted a war like God. They wanted a war like Messiah. They wanted somebody that would throw over the government. Not so. Jesus said, I'll give them a picture that they won't forget. I'll come to them riding on the coat, a fold of an ass. Because I come in peace. And I come in love. When is this world that we live in ever going to understand our answers to our problems are not our fighting forces? It's not our war machines. The answer to every problem is found in love and compassion and grace and mercy and the peace of Jesus Christ. But the world can't have it because we have not received it. Now, don't, don't take me wrong. If I have not experienced peace, how can I give peace? I can't give what I don't have. But Jesus said, I want them to know if they ever grasp this, that I'm Messiah that comes in peace. And there was another part of that picture that's not here, but I can back this up historically. The week of, of, uh, uh, the, 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 the week of Passover, 
for the Jews was a, a great celebration. They had celebrated for 1,760 years the slaying of the lamb and putting the blood on the doorpost for Moses and the deliverance from Egypt. And uh, so they had done that. And during the time of the Passover, they killed massive amounts of sheep. 20,000. Some have said as much as 200,000. But there was, a, there was a process. The reason Jesus was there. I've been there. I, if you've ever been to Israel, I've stood on that Palm Sunday road and oh, what goosebumps are there. As it looks down, looking over into the city, looking towards the eastern gate. But where they did, they brought those lambs that were to be slain. Those, that 100,000 lambs that could not wash away a sin, but only cover a sin. <laughs> that that was so limited but yet the one that would break that and bring deliverance and power through the shed blood of Jesus Christ he said let me give them a picture for when they started down with those lambs down that Palm Sunday road now sitting upon the donkey now they're throwing out the, the palm branches in their coats and he mingles into the crowd of 200,000 sheep one man giving a picture that they would never forget. John the Baptist had seen it when nobody else had seen it. You remember when John saw him coming down the banks and that he was coming to, and to be baptized? And John said, no, no, I can't baptize. Do you remember what John said before he ever got in the water? He looked up. John had, John, I need to preach. John, John, John had the Holy Ghost. Oh yeah, he, he, he was a Pentecostal. He was John the Baptist, John the Pentecostal Baptist. <laughs> Well, he was, because he had received the Holy Ghost in his mother's womb. You see, Elizabeth has a child that's six months in her womb that hasn't moved. Now, I don't know a lot, but mamas, I know this. If you have a baby in your womb that has not moved in six months, you're in trouble. Why has that baby not moved? Because there has to be another announcement over in Nazareth with a little olive complected 15, 16 year old girl that the Holy Ghost shows up one night and said, that that is conceived in you is of me. And she could have refused. God doesn't coerce us to follow Him. God didn't beat us over the head. My mom tried that. It wouldn't work. God doesn't, doesn't coerce us to follow Him. But that little lady said, be it unto me according to your word. And then because of the embarrassment, she took a little trip over to her aunt's house, Sister Elizabeth. And when she got there, the baby that was in her womb had not moved. Because unless there is a Messiah, there does not need to be a forerunner of Messiah. Unless there's a Messiah, there don't need to be a John the Baptist. So it's all on hold. But when Mary walks in the door, what happened? The baby leaped within her womb. Yeah. Now there's a purpose for John. John was filled with the Holy The next time he sensed that was standing on that border and seeing, seeing Jesus come and he saw him come and, and, and he had a revelation. I, w I wish I could pictures. Look at his pictures. I, I see him as he's trembling, pointing, and, and I hear his voice cracking as he says, Behold, Behold! What, what was it? He's just had a revelation that no one has ever had before. A first time revelation. Behold! I'm sorry. I just heard Paula say, I told you to be quiet. Please soften you. Behold the Lamb of God. You know what he was saying? It's not a two legged lamb. All of those years, Israel thought it was a two-legged or a four-legged lamb. It's a two-legged lamb. That's what John saw. Behold, behold, not a four-legged lamb, a two-legged lamb. And what else did he receive? And this ought to make you shout the reason we ought to be dancing in the streets. Because the next thing he said, he's not just a God of the Jews and a deliverer of the Jews. He's a four-legged, two-legged lamb that is going to bring deliverance to the whole world. You see, 
You see, if you have to be a Jew, I'm left out. <laughs> but because he didn't just come, he came for us all. Red and yellow, black and white, we are precious in his sight. And they see this two-legged lamb coming down that hillside and that throng of sheep. And the veil is lifted. And they start singing, Hosanna. Hosanna, thou son of David. Hosanna is not his name. I, I, I'm sorry, it's not. We hear, have Christmas songs and they meant well. They, they call him Hosanna in Christmas songs. His name is not Hosanna. Hosanna, you, you mentioned it. Save us now. We, we've caught a glimpse of Messiah. We don't understand, but, but, but we need salvation. Not next week, not next week. We need it now. Isn't that us? Isn't that the reason we came here today? Oh, I came because mama made me. I came because it was, you know, the thing to do. No. I came here because I can cry out no matter what my plight Save me. And do you know what? They were crying, save us now. And Jesus was saying, that is exactly what I have come to do. Before this week's out, that prayer will have been answered once and for all. They tried to get him to stop his crowd of worshipers. If you read 19th chapter of Luke, I won't go there. It's in there. You can read it when you get home. 19th chapter of Luke, is, they, they, they bid him, said, can you hear what they're saying? And he said, I can. He said, well, stop them. Stop this stuff. And he said, if I stop them from, praise you were talking about last week. If I stop this, if they do not praise me, then the rocks will cry out. It was only four days later. <coughs> At noon, when the sun had turned as black, darkness was upon the face of the deep. There was nobody praising him then. They were cursing him. They were challenging him to come down. They were spitting upon him. Oh yeah, wasn't, wasn't nobody praising him. But in that, in, that, in that veil of silence, have you ever been there? That silence when you just give anything to hear something. Multiply that a thousand times over that veil of silence that hung over that cross. But after all, he is the Son of God, and he said, If you don't praise, the rocks will, and an earthquake came, and the rocks were red. I've been in an earthquake or two, and it makes a sound that you'll never forget. This bothers me. And, and, and I, I used to didn't give things that bother me, but it bothers me. When God admonishes us that our, our ultimate goal in this world, can you just, just think with me just a minute, is to worship God. Not to preach sermons. I can worship God through preaching. Not, not to sing. or not. I can do that through that. But my, my your, your whole role you're not a doctor, lawyer, Indian chief. That's what you do to, to make your, your bread and eat. Your, your purpose is to aggrandize, to praise, to lift up. For he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Praise. By the way, let me help you with something. We, we, need, we need to get this right. Because when we go to heaven, I, the only thing that I see that we're gainfully employed in is worship. I don't know about you. I don't want to miss this. Now I say that because if, if we're not careful because of our, our, our differing backgrounds, our, our culture, praise means something different to so many people. What, what, when, when we talk about worshiping Him and praising Him, what, what does that mean? That, does it mean lift your hands? Well, it, it, the Bible says that, but anybody, 
Do you ever remember the first time you raised your hands in church? Am I the only one? I'm 6'2", and I'm going to tell you what. I, there for a few weeks, I got them here. And I was checking to see who was looking then. And, I, and then after a week or so, I got them here. And I remember when to go the full length. And I thought, my God, they're never going to stop. <laughs> and and I, I just knew I was standing there exposed to the world. Is it, is it, is it praying loudly? Oh, what about singing loudly? Or, or is it singing softly worship and praise? So what, what, what is it? Is it, uh, is it looking up to God? Is it closing my eyes? See, I found out. It took me years to find out God, God didn't matter if you looked around while you prayed. Y'all had not learned that yet, have you? The Bible said watch and pray. He said, I was a pastor. Now you know I'm an evangelist because you couldn't talk like that if you're a pastor. <laughs> uh, is, 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 is worship a group that I really like? Is it the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir? Or, or is it, you got, by the way, I, I told the brother that led last week, and you, the worship in this church is fantastic. For your size, you are to be envied anywhere in this world because you come with the, to this front, and I commend you, I commend you, that you come to this front bringing us into the presence of God. But you can't worship for me. I can't carry a tune in a bucket with a lid on it, but you can't worship for me. Let everything that hath breath. What, what is, is it? Is it, is, it a, is it a soft... Is it hands folded? Is it hand? What is it? Is it, uh, is it? is it experiences of different cultures? I, one of my favorite places in the world to preach is with the, the Zonga tribes down in the Gudentang in, in South Africa. And, and uh, the, I love their worship. I, the, their ladies worship. I, I, I'd rather preach their ladies meeting than anything I've ever been in. Because they camp out around this old structure of a church and they spend the whole week with the fires built around and they, they, they rejoice and I was preaching for them, Sister Miss Singy after they, I would never seen anybody worship like that in my life. And then she got up and said well we'll just go home. If y'all not going to worship any better than that, we'll just go to the house. She said uh, because you got an American here, you're not, not really worshiping God, I'm going to give you one more chance. She said. <laughs> and they took off and they did something I'd never heard before. They whistled when they worshiped. And I loved it. And I asked myself, where did that come from? And, you know, dumb, dumb white preacher. They said, they looked at me and said, Pastor, the Bible said, make a joyful noise. A whistle is a joyful noise, is it not? I said, I like it. Hallelujah. I liked it enough that I borrowed it. And I came back and I was preaching a large camp meeting in Baton Rouge. And got there late and moved up to the front seat, and uh, they were having church, man. And before I knew it, and I heard it just sort of tail off, and I come back, and I saw the moderator of the meeting motion for the head usher, come here, come, come here. And he was shaking his finger. I knew then he was sending him to tell him to find out who was disturbing the service and get him out. And I was about to go to their pulpit to preach. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to make this. I, I, don't want, I, don't, I don't want you to miss this. It's important that we get this right. Worship. I, <laughs> I don't want to fail there. I want my efforts to be Worthy of him who is infinite and endless and depthless and boundless. Jesus said something here. I want you to get ready to show that picture. He said, when they questioned him about what they were saying, he said, He said, For I have perfected praise. Okay, I, see, that got my attention. It's perfect, 
This is perfect. By the way, the word perfected there means matured. I have, I have matured praise. I can show you what praise looks like. Let's show them what praise looks like. <laughs> now, I really didn't have to show that picture, but that's my newest granddaughter. She's a beauty, isn't she? Huh? Yes. Looks like her obby a little bit, don't she? <laughs> She's the joy of our life. She's the tenth to come to us. But come on. Come on, let's, let's, let's get serious. Infinite God. Infinite God says that is the picture of mature praise. Oh, come on. Y'all acting like, well, yeah, I guess. Or not. Look. Look, that, 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 she is a nursing baby. Now, what you don't know, let, let me tell you why I believe that he said that. He said, mature praise is born out of first praise. You still with me? Mature praise is born out of first praise. Now, what you're not going to see there, and I long for it because after ten grandchildren, we, we look for the stages when they come. Right now, her eyes moves to mama's voice and daddy's voice. And other than just being nurtured and having her diet changed, that's about it. But in just a few days, probably by the time I get home, she's going to discover something. That some of you have been too busy to notice. If you have children, enjoy every day. Let God teach you something through every step. Bridget, she's going to understand and find her hands. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Mama's voice now, Daddy's voice, this is about her. She has, she, they've been there all along, but she didn't know they were there. But now she's, and for hours and days, she's going to giggle and she's going to laugh and she's going to play with them and she's gonna, it's just silly. Oh, wow, wow, wow. And she's just going to bubble over with awe of something so far beyond her that she knows she had nothing to do with, but what a neat trick, putting these on the end of arms. Isn't that great? <laughs> praise. Matured praise is remembering praise of first things. First things. You remember first things? See, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we got so busy living, we don't, we don't think or remember. You remember first things? Uh, yeah, we were talking about cars the other day. In America, cars are rite of passage. You get a car. If, and if you got, I had a very poor family, so I didn't get much of a car. But uh, I finally got one I wanted. But the first one I got was, uh, I wish I had a picture of it. I'd show you. It was called the Goose. Uh, and uh, it was rusty. You could go all day on a dollar's gas worth of gas. It was a 1960 Ford Fairlane four-door. Um, you could go all day on a dollar's worth of gas, but you had to have a five-gallon bucket of oil to stop and fill it up to keep it going. And, and, and they wouldn't let me ride it today because I looked like a mosquito truck spraying. <laughs> but my first car, I can remember sitting in that car. I never had a car before. My car. And even before I had to put gas in the car, to go boom, 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 act like I was driving. I, I, by the way, I finally got a little money, and I thought the thing that it needed most was not engine work or, or other things. I put leather interior in that. I figured if I could get a girl to sit down, I might get a date. So that was how that worked out. Do you remember first thing? You remember the first time you ever flew in an airplane? See, that's lost its splendor because it's so common. But I still like to get on a plane and get to sit by some 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 young lady or some young man as their first time in their tents and they're taking in everything and, and you just get completely excited with because it is first things. Those of you that are married, do you remember the first time you saw your companion? Uh-huh. 
I remember the first time I saw Sister Silcott. When she walked in, my knees buckled. <laughs> I got a lump in my throat. She was a tad skinny, but I, I, I knew, I knew, I knew. In fact, I knew that was the woman for me. I was in the second grade, and I went home. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you the truth. It's a true story. I went home and told my mother and dad, I'm marrying Paula the brown-headed girl. I, didn't, I was in school with her to the fourth grade, didn't see her until after I graduated, walked into a conference and said the same thing all over again. But my prayers don't let me forget the first time. If we forget the first time, we've, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I told you I wouldn't preach it. I, this just came out of my journal from here, and you preach. It's his fault. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. I remember the first time that I came to Hong Kong. If I live to be 10,000, I'll never forget it. Oh, you don't understand. You young people back then, it was, a real, it, was, it was a real trial just to get the plane in. You had to fly right through the middle of town, hard right bank, and, and land off of a hard right bank. It was considered the, the most dangerous airport on the face of the globe. But I remember landing there, and I stepped out, and I smelled the smell that is Hong Kong. That's burned. That's burned into my memory. It's not bad. It's burned into my memory. I, I remember seeing the people. I remember thinking, God, what grace that you allowed me to come here. And I want to tell you something. Every time I land here, it's the first time all over again. was the first time that you ever recognized this book? No, I, oh, you've seen it. You knew, knew about it. But, but does anybody remember the first time that you read something and you said, oh, whoa, hang, hang on, somebody's been tattling on me. Because it was like your name was written on those scriptures. I can remember thinking, how? How, how do they know? How does he know? How, how, how does he know? But then I realized this is not Moby Dick. This is not the, the tale of two cities. This is, this is the rhema, the logos, and the rhema of the Word of God. And that my name, my name is on every page. When was the first time you realized your name? What about the first time? I'm not about praise. Praise is of first things. What about the first time that you realize that God really does answer prayer? Remember again for the first time. You know how I found that out? I, I got just a second and I'll close. I found it out when I was six years old. Yes. That God... God answers prayer, even for six-year-olds. I had the world's ugliest dog. It had come up astray, a beautiful little puppy, and had turned into the most, I just, you can't imagine anything that bad. You couldn't get him fat. He, one of those dogs, that you, the more you feed him, the skinnier he got. His tail was about that long, and it was like a whip. He hit everybody that came in, and uh, it was not a pretty sight, and the whole neighborhood wanted him gone. But he's my dog. Now, I don't know how I knew that morning that uh, I woke up to go to school. My mother had to go to work before, and the neighbors were going to the state of Mississippi. We lived in Alabama up in the country, and they said, it'd be a good time for y'all to take that dog, carry him up there, and find him a good home many, many miles from here that he can never get back here. And so they left. I woke up. I knew the moment I woke up, my dog wasn't there. 
I, 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 I started looking, 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 feverishly looking, looking. My, my sister-in-law, who was keeping us uh, uh, in those times between school, uh, she finally had to call my mother. Uh, at work, she, my mother had to come home. I was, I, I, all I knew is that my dog was gone, and the only outlet I knew is, is that God did things like that, and I'm telling you, I went into intercessory prayer. And I prayed as only a six-year-old boy could pray. My mother came home and she said, I don't know how to console him. When all of a sudden, about 11 o'clock that morning, the truck came back into the driveway. They pulled the tarp back, and my dog jumped out. And they talked about a storm that came that they couldn't get through. I know, that's not sophisticated enough for you, is it? See, that, that's, 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 that's just childish stuff. I could stand here for days and tell you how many times that has been reenacted where he has met every need of my life but don't let me let it ever be anything but the first time that's that's when the awe you, you remember the awe the excitement that's that's the praise god is is asking for us on this palm sunday just just one more time like the first time just allow yourself you see i've come to conclude this that God, He's really not so much concerned with method of praise. But I do believe He's concerned with the heart of praise. Yes. And my prayer has been, Lord, don't let me. <laughs> Forget the first time. Somebody said, what you want us to do? I don't know. I want you to stand with me right now. Because I'm at my limit. I, I, I don't want to tell you how to, but I want to ask you to do this. Don't just do it here. See, 